Stay in the car. I don't want anybody seeing you. Uh, fine. Hello, and welcome to Picture Cars. Today, you're going to learn about the interesting choices for the cars and trucks used in Sonic the Hedgehog, starring James Marsden, Jim Carrey, and... John Raphael! Take me there. Oh! <laughs> oh. <laughs> Who are you? I... I mean Ben Schwartz. We're going to talk a little bit about autonomous vehicles too, because why? Dr. Robotnik made and showcased a ton of them, so why not? There is a lot going on in this movie. The producers do a great job of blending backstory and motivations of the title character with the supporting cast of the Wachowski family and Dr. Robotnik. And I'm including Tom and Maddie and the Wachowski family, of course, but also at times it's Sonic, and at other times there's Maddie's family to add as well, Rachel and Jojo. I'm not one to analyze character detail though, I'm here to explore the cars, and in this one we have some smart choices in the form of a glaring anomaly. Not a dumb choice, just an interesting choice for Marsden's truck. We also have Rachel's Volvo XC90, as well as the autonomous vehicles presented by Dr. Eggman. So I'm going to split this video into three parts. The Toyota Tacoma, the Volvo XC90, and Robotnik's autonomous vehicles. This way, if all you came for is to talk about the truck, you can tune out afterwards. But for everyone else, you can be pleasantly surprised while discussing the other two options. Oh, thank God. Let's talk about why the Toyota Tacoma TRD 4x4 off-road package is such an interesting choice for Cinemotive design purposes. This is a newer model vehicle, which is fine. The year is only a minor point. And as far as identification goes, we can determine model year based on the grill. So it has to be either a 2018 or 2019 model year. But in a movie filled with Olive Garden sponsorships, Zillow, many others, you'd figure a Toyota sponsorship would try to lure in the crowd with a 2020 model. Is Toyota using the movie as a giant commercial? It's kind of hard to see their angle, but yes, I'd say they are. The proof? We have a whole car chase scene in which the Tacoma gets destroyed, but still showcases its reliability and resourcefulness. From a design perspective, what are we trying to communicate? Well, what is Toyota known for? Long-term reliability, quality, Kaizen even, but for Sonic, Sonic, some of those things don't matter. What I'm sure they're trying to have us focus on is their reliability. We have a newer model, the grill being only one generation older, so they're still communicating youthful modern design choices. And let's be honest, the Tacoma's design has been futuristic for its four-year tenure thus far. Said a different way, it's been timely since its release. Am I bothered by the sponsorship though? No, not at all. What I'm initially bothered by is the choice of a Toyota Tacoma by a Montana sheriff in his late 40s whose family has been in law enforcement for more than 50 years. Maddie's words? Not mine. I mean, there's been a Wachowski protecting this town for more than 50 years. What I'm most bothered by is the Montana part. What I'm second most confused by is the family dynamic part of it all. Montana's most popular vehicles in two different studies, using two different data sets of differing years, meaning obviously they're suspect, have pointed toward the Ford F-150 and the Chevy Impala to be the most sold or most popular vehicle in the state of Montana. In 2016, another study showed the most popular trucks in order were the Ram pickup truck, Ford F-250, followed by the Toyota Tacoma. Wait, what? Top five, maybe? Okay then this is starting to make a little more sense. Let's take a look at the family dynamic and income then. Our main supporting character, Tom Wachowski, comes from a family of law enforcement officers. James Marsden, our beautiful actor, is 47. So we'll assume late 40s for the character as well. Law enforcement doesn't require a four-year degree, so we can assume he began employment around the age of 20. With a constant median salary, not compensating for raises or change in title to sheriff, a deputy in Montana would make approximately $36,000, which isn't great. We also know he was working three jobs while his girlfriend is going through college. What did you do the entire time I was in veterinary school? I worked a second job to pay the rent and... A third for... job to pay tuition. Now, he's an elected sheriff at a median salary of 99000 give or take, and she is making something in the ballpark of 75000 as a veterinarian. 
Now, no college debt is an assumption. No kids, a dog, a home. What I'm getting at is they have money to pick their cars and he picked the Toyota Tacoma instead of the more popular Dodge Ram truck, which I'm sure a father or grandfather owned. But maybe, and here's my final theory, maybe, since we don't see Wachowski's parents in this small town, and really, it's a small town, so we would have run into them if what I posit next isn't true. Maybe Tom's parents were in an accident in their most popular vehicle in Montana, which is why they go to Olive Garden so often, because when you're here, you're family. Now Tom has to think about his car loyalties and pays a little bit more attention to the perks of the vehicle. So now, now, let's explore why the Tacoma was such a smart thing for him. The off-road package started out at the cheaper of the two, $31,150 versus $31,895 for a sport trim level. And really, this figure is actually contested, but you know, dealerships. And there are a couple of advantages to selecting the off-road level. This has been dissected by people who are more into cars than I am, but generally, there are the benefits of terrain selection and control, which are available on the Wachowski chosen 4x4 deal, and an electronically locking rear differential. Now, I didn't see a Jeep on the list of most popular Montana vehicles, and I only bring this up because of what I'm going to say next. Of the most popular slash wisest choices for a Montana Sheriff, he has chosen the most nimble of off-road vehicles. He doesn't have to haul a family, though he could use this to make that transition, so he chose the lightest option, which was still an off-road capable truck. And I'm sticking to my theory that his dad was killed in a truck accident, but that trucks were always a part of his nature. So why buy a Jeep when trucks are in your blood? Is it the best vehicle choice? Maybe not, but given the constraints of design and I'm sure the sponsor deal, the Toyota Tacoma made so much more sense than anything else in the Toyota lineup, including the Tundra and 4Runner. Now, let's shift focus and look at the San Francisco car. Tom just got his truck's top lasered off by the most energy-dense robot in the history of cinema. And we can't really drive that to the Transamerica Pyramid Tower. So, let's borrow the sister-in-law's car. She already hates us. What more could we do to harm that relationship? Apparently, the answer is, let Sonic drive? There have been comments like, oh, it would have been so much better if he drove the Chevy Sonic. And while, yes, that'd be pretty sweet, we're trying to accomplish a couple of different things with this car specifically that we couldn't do with the Chevy Sonic. One is brand recognizability, the other, color choice. The Chevy Sonic would only be fun for the audience after the fact when their brother-in-law brings it up as an anecdote during game night, because the general audience doesn't see the Sonic grill and go, Whoa! but in the theater, you see Volvo, and you recognize that as safe. So while the concept of a 10, maybe 12 year old driving is terrifying, we're not scared for their life during the drive. Then we have this color. And with Sonic, our main character, we have a blue palette that we need to maintain without washing it out. And most action adventure movies have posters and color palettes that include a lot of warm colors in contrast with the blue. And this poster even is a lot different from that scheme. This movie, is incredibly interesting in the color regard, because most of this movie is spent either in Montana or on the road. So our environmental background is green and gray. So when we switch settings to the city, what we've effectively done is flip the color palette of their car in relation to the background. Yeah. So while in the verdant forestry, we're mainly in a silver truck, but as we move to the concrete and steel of the city, we go to a green car. It's a subtle decision, and maybe it wasn't on purpose, but if it was, I think this is really smart. It allows color consistency with our hedgehog even after fixing the splash of red shoe from JoJo. And if we want to explore this even further, which I do, let's look at Sonic's character color palette. And we could look at the colors of all the characters or video game levels, but in this video, we're going to only discuss Sonic's color palette. Of course, we have blue, white, and tan color along with red for the shoes, but did you know, and you probably did, that Sonic's eyes are green too? This is what I mean by color consistency, and that is an attention to detail like no other. 
Finally, now that we're in San Francisco, we can talk about autonomous vehicles. For the mesh of car and movie enthusiasts who might not all know, San Francisco is the hotbed of autonomous vehicle development. There's this whole history, and maybe we'll get into it, but what I will comment on and ask is Paramount. Why didn't you, with all these other sponsors, try to add a prominent autonomous vehicles company? There are a lot of self-driving vehicles in development with varying degrees of sensor robustness. Tesla is the big one for the layman, but there's Waymo, Cruise, Aurora, Zoox, Argo AI, Luminar, Too Simple, Neuro, so many to name. Tesla has been standing by their camera only comment for so much time and there's an abundance of Tesla zealots that one might think that that is the preferred method of making an autonomous vehicle. Their argument here, we drive with only our eyes and the only sensor that replicates this is a camera, therefore cars should only need cameras to sense their environment. What Tesla fails to understand here is you shouldn't be trying to replicate a human driver you should be trying to make a better driver, and other developers are trying to accomplish this, creating robots that are safer than the everyday driver. So they employ radar, lidar, ultrasonic sensors, and then, through sensor fusion, they combine all this data so they create a three-dimensional data set. Then they filter out all the data noise so that the robot vehicle has a 3D representation of their surroundings, which they can then calculate intention through perception. It's a whole process and I'll try to link some more exploratory videos down below, but autonomous vehicles are amazing. Anyway, then after, these autonomous vehicles can see so much more than even the best drivers. Now that the general primer is out of the way, let's look at Robotnik's design. And we have drones and cars to look at. In general, we need to maintain an Eggman shape, so we have these large egg-shaped drones which don't allow for spinning radar lidar protrusions, which typically bloat from the design of the vehicle outward. Side note, Luminar has developed lidar without the spinning hardware. Let's get back into it. Stylistically, we also need this menacing design element that is consistent and recognizably Eggman, so we use this red lensed camera, which also allows Robotnik to see what the robot sees. Then we also have the camera eye also acting as both a storage container and laser. With the laser on the last robot, we come to a pretty interesting idea. The combination of camera and laser vision, which is essentially how LiDAR works. That's a gross misunderstatement, but we won't get into that. I mean, Robotnik is a genius PhD, right? Maybe he got to the same result Luminar was going for which would add a little bit more credibility to that genius claim. That's extraordinary. To bring it all together, this movie is incredibly interesting in its creative choices. At first glance, you don't pay much attention to the car choices. You maybe get the Toyota Tacoma and that's all that you get. Then, on further inspection, you realize the recognizability of the brands. Then, on that final last pass, with my help, you understand the intelligence in the decision-making and cinemotive design choices, even if the autonomous vehicle sensors aren't designed perfectly. The Toyota Tacoma doesn't intuitively make sense for a red-blooded American sheriff, but upon investigation and a fake backstory, it makes a ton more sense why he chose the Tacoma for his daily driver. The Volvo XC90, an amazing choice for a mother in San Francisco, which has some of the harshest driving conditions, which has the most safety features that Volvo had to offer for the vehicle year and still within a single mother's budget. And then Eggman's simplified sensors for his autonomous vehicles lend a suspension of disbelief and some credibility to his intelligence. They either put a lot of thought in the cinemotive design phase of pre-production or they got really lucky. And I like to think it's the former. Thanks for watching. I have a lot of fun making these videos. So, leave a comment of another car you'd like me to analyze. Let me know if you think I missed anything in this one as well. Thanks again, and I'll see you guys in the next one.